Missionary, Christ Missionary Christianity, A Muslim's Analysis Part 2 Supplying the missing information, clarifying the vagueness and finishing the incomplete thoughts of the missionary Christian. An Article of Faith The fundamentalist professes, I believe the Bible to be totally inspired of God, inerrant in the original manuscripts. On the one hand, this is a statement of his belief, while on the other hand it is the basis of his belief, the first because this is said to be his conviction. The second, because the miraculous aspect of the Bible's inerrancy convinces him that God is the author. However, the statement cannot do either job. First, he believes that God ordered the writing of all the Bible. This must include 1 Corinthians 7 verse 25 where Paul writes without the command of God, a contradiction. Second, the miraculous inerrancy of the Bible is something he has never seen. Many biblical errors are excused as being copying errors. That is, the original manuscripts, which are lost forever, are said, to be inerrant but not those manuscripts which we have today. The statement, intended to serve as both an article of faith and the justification for such faith, fails because it is not universally applied in the first usage and it cites evidence which cannot be produced in the second usage. Many of the verses in the Bible seem to contradict each other. However, these are often matters that can be reconciled by better understanding of translation and context. This kind of reconciliation is the subject of many Christian books and is a healthy process. But some have deceived themselves into thinking that this means every biblical contradiction is only apparent and can be explained. Actually there is another category of contradictions which is not explainable by consideration of translation or context. It is the existence of this type of discrepancy that has caused the words, in the original manuscripts, to be added to any claim that the Bible is free of error. These are the so-called copying mistakes, e. G. Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7. Here again the believer in total Bible inspiration neglects to apply his belief universally. At Isaiah 40 verse 8, the Bible states that God's word stands forever, it does not get lost in the recopying. If the Christian takes this part of the Bible as inspired how can he admit that other portion have not stood till now, let alone forever? At this point the Christian redefines exactly what he means by God's word. He says that it is not so much the individual words of the Bible, these were chosen by the human writers, but the message which is God's word. So small statistical errors do not invalidate the Bible's totally divine authority. Once more we have an answer which opposes a previous claim, it was the supposed amazing accuracy of the individual words themselves that testify to the divine quality of the Bible. Now these words are said to be only human efforts under a more vague, in-breathing, inspiration, of God. Words and Message Jesus outlined a principle of reliability at Luke 16 verse 10, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Now the missionary excuses small mistakes while maintaining that there are no big mistakes in the Bible. But Jesus' words do not allow for this separation of small and big errors. So the last Christian answer is used again. The missionary says that the message is one subject and it contains no errors big or small, but the actual words of the Bible might possibly contain error. Both the Muslim and the Christian should take note of this distinction. The Quran talks about the Injil of Jesus, meaning the particular message he delivered. Both the missionary and the careless Muslim may believe that this Injil is the same as the four Gospels, the biblical accounts of the life of Jesus. The Muslim should realize and the Christian should be ready to admit that the exact words of the four Gospel accounts are not the same as the message of Jesus. The Gospels narrate the events of his life and at times quote him. More correctly, the words of Jesus are paraphrased in the Gospels. His sayings are recast but not directly quoted necessarily. In fact, the famous Lord's Prayer will be found in two different versions at Matthew 6 and Luke 11. In a similar way, the Quran mentions the Torah of Moses. Again, it must not be imagined that the message of Moses survives verbatim in today's Bible. A claim like this was made in the prophet Jeremiah's day, but we read, How can you say, We are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Rut behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. Jeremiah 8 verse 8 In the following, we are concerned with the words of Jesus, not with the things people wrote about him. We do not pick and choose from the Bible according to what we like, but grant that the fundamentalist Christian likes all of the Bible. Therefore, he should be willing to discuss any quotation made here, although the Muslim is not conceding any authenticity. Our method We intend to use the methods already illustrated to deal with the most basic issue between Christians and Muslims. The method has been to clarify what is vague, to expose neglected information, and to finish incomplete thoughts. This method enables us to turn to the words attributed to Jesus in the Bible and we can then determine where his words have been, over-specified. 
made, to say more than they mean, or where his words have been at twice sold, given two interpretations. Our issue. The primary issue is finally, not whether Jesus was divine, but whether he said that he was. Let us illustrate and then summarize the method of investigating the missionary's claim. Overspecification. In the overspecified category we have such passages as John chapter 6, John 3 verse 16 and the 10th chapter of John. At 641 Jesus says, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. In this chapter, he compares himself to the manna eaten by the Israelites in Moses' time. Quoting scripture he calls the manna bread out of heaven, Psalm 78 verse 24. The vagueness in this argument is the fact that the Christian has not stated that he intends to make an exact parallel between Jesus and the manna, if one comes from heaven, so does the other. The information he has neglected involves the origin of the manna. Of course it was not prepared in heaven and then transported to earth. According to Numbers 11:9, it came from the same place as the dew. So a thought must be finished. If the Christian maintains that Jesus literally came out of the heaven where God lives, he forces a literal meaning from the words while allowing a figurative meaning for the same words in the case of the manna out of heaven. John 3 verse 16 is where the Christian says Jesus claimed status as not just a figurative son of God but as God's actual, only begotten a son. Not all Bible translate the passage with this key word because some translators have seen the difficulty this causes. At Hebrews 11 verse 17, the same Greek word is found in the original language. But in this place it refers to Isaac who was at no time, strictly speaking, Abraham's only begotten son. In the case of Isaac the church explains that only begotten is not to be understood strictly but must be modified. However, no such modification is allowed in the case of John 3 verse 16 when it is overspecified as being literally true. In the 10th chapter of John we read about the Jews trying to stone Jesus and saying that he had made himself equal to God. The Christian agrees with the Jews and overlooks Jesus' reply. He proceeds to tell them that their own scriptures refer to certain evil men as the gods. Therefore, he argued that it was even more appropriate that one actually sent by God should be called a son of God. He had also said that it was appropriate to call a peacemaker a son of God, Matthew 5 verse 9. The Jews and Christians overspecify his words when they insist that he has claimed divinity. There is another poorly conceived argument which is related to this. Where the Jews have understood Jesus to blaspheme, i.e., e, claim divine authority, the Christian says he has proof that Jesus did claim divinity. The incorrect assumption however, is that the Jews understood Jesus. For example, they understood him to seize divine authority when he told a man that his sins were forgiven, Mark 2. But the verse at John 12 verse 49, among others, shows that Jesus denied any personal initiative. He spoke only what God commanded him to say. The Messiah. Still more badly thought through is an argument based on common Christian misunderstanding. Muslims agree that Jesus was the Messiah. Although modern Bible translations hide the fact, many individuals are called a Messiah in the Bible. Christians have come to believe that there is a connotation of divinity in the word, however. So when they read that Jesus admitted to being the Messiah and the Jewish high priest declared it blasphemy, they feel that they have still more proof that Jesus claimed divinity. The high priest could only protest what he thought was a lie, a slander against God. The Jews were awaiting the Messiah. Were they also ready to kill the first man who said that he was the Messiah because such a claim is blasphemous? Twice sold. In the twice sold category, we have verses like John 10 verse 30 and 14 colon 9. The first one reads, I and the Father are one. The Christian leaves vague exactly what this sentence itself leaves vague, one what? The overlooked information is found in the 17th chapter of John where the same idea occurs more than once and includes the disciples of Jesus in this oneness. See John 17 11, 21 to 22. The thought that should be finished is this. If Jesus meant to say that being one means being divine then are the disciples also divine in the same sense as Jesus since the same expression includes them? As it happens the phrase has been sold twice. The 17th chapter verses are quoted in support of unity of purpose while the 10th chapter verse is used to support the claim that Jesus announced his Godhood. Many students of the Bible have an understanding of scriptures which is quite reasonable. However, these same students forget their interpretation at times and sell another one to the Muslim. They do not seem to notice this double standard. A clear illustration is the case of John 14 verse 9. Ask where Jesus claimed divinity explicitly and one is most often shown this verse, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Clarification of the argument exhibits the difficulties. 
The Christian means to say that if one's eyes sees Jesus, they see God because Jesus is God. Even this clarification cannot be stated without trading on something left vague, namely, the Trinitarian distinction between Father and Son. Jesus said that seeing him was seeing the Father, yet Jesus is the Son. So they tell us, read God for Father. In any case, the argument is self-defeating. If seeing Jesus is seeing God, or the Father, because they are one and the same then how could Jesus tell people who were looking at him that they had never seen or heard God, the Father? This is his statement in John 5 verse 37. Now the Christian responds to a question which has not been asked. We have not said that John 14 verse 9 is in conflict with 537 and asked for an explanation. But he proceeds to explain that the verses are in harmony because they refer to Jesus as one who reveals what God is like. People who did not receive Jesus did not see God. But our question is how the first interpretation of John 14 verse 9 can be harmonized with John 5 verse 37. They have provided a second interpretation for John 14. 9 And yet the next time someone asks them to show a Bible passage where Jesus claims divinity, be sure that they will go to the first interpretation and quote this favorite verse. He who has seen me has seen the Father. The status of the Bible. In such discussions, several things should be noted. First, the Muslim does not have to reinterpret Christian scripture. Our duty is to insist that a man state his case clearly, not in vague terms. We must ask for all information related to the matter, where else do we find keywords and phrases in the Bible? We must demand that thoughts expressed are carried to their logical conclusion. Let us illustrate again with another familiar example. An all-purpose quotation is John 14 verse 6, I am the way, and the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father, but through me. Exactly what this verse is supposed to prove is left vague. Does it prove the divinity of Jesus? Is it supposed to mean that God listens to no one except Jesus or those who call on Jesus? If either of these ideas are to be based on the verse, we have to consider all the available information. The dictionary shows that the words way, truth, and life do not automatically carry connotations of divinity. So the Christian insists that the structure of the sentence stresses the way, the truth, and the life, as though Jesus is unique for all time. Bill Clinton may be the American president, but he is not the first and probably not the last. So language usage alone does not do the job. Then another thought must be brought to its conclusion. The life is said to be a state of affairs, one either has the life or not. In this way the verse is used in support of the redeeming power of Jesus. Yet Jesus himself says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. John 10 verse 10. In this passage life is not a state of affairs either positive or negative, with no other possible states. Jesus speaks here of something that can be measured. The verse John 14 verse 6 is used by the missionary with the vaguest of intentions. Ironically enough, when his meaning is questioned, this verse becomes probably the most overspecified of all Bible texts. What is the goal of the evangelists? by Abdul Azim Gregor Shepherd. I recently came across a copy of the The Great Commission New Testament, published out of Nashville, USA, in 1982. Turning to the first page, we read in large bold type, this is a marked copy of the New Testament, the first sentence says. God offers salvation as a free gift. After three short quotes expounding this free gift, we are again directed in large bold type to turn to page 177. The evangelists will tell you that this book is God's living word, but who cares about actually reading it? Just go straight to page 177. Skip 176 pages and go right to the core. Surely these 176 pages of God's word actually contain some important information? Most of which are supposedly quotes from Jesus. On page 177 we read in large bold print at the top of the page realize you are a sinner, and we are directed to read the underlined verse, Romans 3 verse 23. At the bottom of the page, we are then directed in large bold print to skip to page 180. Turning to the said page, we read at the top, the penalty for sin is death, once again in large bold print. We scan down the page to the underlined section of a single verse from Romans 6 verse 23 and at the bottom of the page, in large bold print we are directed to refer to page 178. Turning back to page 178 at the top we read in large bold print Christ paid your penalty, and we are obliged to read the underlined three verses explaining this phenomena, Romans 5 verses 8 to 10. Again, at the bottom of the page we are encouraged to turn to page 138, in large bold print. This, choose your own salvation adventure book, is rather entertaining. On the top of page 138 we find again in large bold print you must repent, and our gaze falls upon an underlined verse, Acts 3 verse 19. 
The bottom of the page directs us to refer to page 220 in large bold print. On page 220 written in large bold print at the top of the page we find, you must accept Christ by faith. How else would one do this? And we notice an underlined verse, Ephesians 2 verse 8. The large bold print at the bottom of the page refers us to page 183. Finding our way back over the 40 pages which we have not even glanced at, we read at the top of page 183 in large bold print, you must confess him as Lord and we notice two underlined passages. Romans 10 verses 9 to 10 and 13. The large bold print at the bottom of the page directs us to turn to the back page of the book. What do we then find after having read a total of seven tiny passages from five pages, out of a total of 292 pages? What happened to the importance of the other 287 pages? We find the delightful question in large bold print at the top of the page, are you ready to receive God's free gift? Which is according to the little prayer below it in italics, Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner and need your forgiveness. I know you died on the cross for me. I now turn from my sins and ask you to forgive me. I now invite you into my heart and life. I now trust you as Savior and follow you as Lord. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Why do we have to ask Jesus for forgiveness and salvation? Cannot God do that? The text continues thus, Did you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Did you ask him to save you? Did you give Jesus complete control of your life? If so, welcome to God's family. Why not pause for a moment and thank him for saving you? I answer no. To all three of these questions. It goes on in large bold print, what does Jesus want you to do now? I marvel at this. If you take the time to study the selected quotes above you will notice that Jesus is quoted, zero times. All the quotations are taken from other than Jesus. Using these quotes as a guideline for determining what Jesus wants for us results in no answer whatsoever. Let us refer to Jesus' words directly to get an answer. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words, that very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. John 12 verses 47 to 48. What does keeping Jesus' words mean? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. John 14 verses 23 to 24. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. John 14 verse 21. If ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14 verse 15. Those who love Jesus, therefore keep his words and commandments and will be loved by both Jesus and his Father since the words and commandments are not from Jesus, but from the Father. These evangelists quote Jesus zero times. They don't care a toss what Jesus has to say because they don't love Jesus since they can't be bothered quoting him. They don't want you to discover the words of Jesus. Their goal is to take Jesus, his words and his commandments, bypass them on the freeway and toss them into the garbage pile. Then they will take their potential proselyte by the left hand and drag him down hand in hand on their faces into the everlasting fire, which is never quenched.